Hello, good evening everyone. Um, welcome to the Dave Show Midstream Reading Series. I'm so honored to be here. I'm Diane Jarvin Powell. And um, I'm trying to figure out all the things I'm supposed to say to you <laughs> in the correct order. So let me figure this out. Uh, phones are one issue that I should probably mention that turn your phones off or down. Um, thank you for wearing masks, but the readers, obviously, when you come up, you can take your, your mask off. Um, and one tradition that Dave Shove, who started this series many years ago, was to go around the room and give your name, and maybe one or two words of, you know, how you describe yourself, or you a poet, or a listener, or a writer, or a reader, or whatever, and so I'm going to start with this guy. Hi, I'm Don Brunfell, and I am a writer and reader of poetry and other kinds of literature as well. I'm Elizabeth, and I am a listener, and support of poetry. I am John. I'm going to be reading tonight, so I'm being supported, and uh, I'm a lover of poetry. I'm Paul. I'm a poet. I'm uh, Frank Hudson, and uh, I'm a poet who fortunately uh, was a poet for us in the Orlando project. Uh, I'm Bill, I'm just a listener. Uh, Terry, uh, listener, the supporter, friend of the yeah. I'm Joel, listener only. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. French poet and um, has been described as responsible in large measure for the creation of the gay liberation movement of France. She's a, she, was a, she has 10 books of poetry out and has written um, other historical works as well. So her poem is called I Am the Awkward Navigator. I am an awkward navigator who, when the wind is up, lets slip the ropes that tangle around her leg, and whose skin suddenly is ripped away. Nothing can outstrip my pain or my surprise. I am the chorister of lovesick angels whose voices are in tune on the first try. They blend and separate again within a very narrow range. Even the break is but accomplishment of a design that reaches to the sky. I am the architect of a loving time without doors or walls or windows where all sharp edges are denied in the heart's eyes according to a special calendar. The architect of almost and always. I am the memory of love, of its impatiences, of its sumptuous clumsiness and feverish melancholy. When premonition veils that dazzling presence, I am the forgetful memory of faults, the premonition that walks on water. So in this time, and this is a day of revolution, and I kind of feel like this is a time of many questions about democracy, about women's bodies. Um, I thought I'd read this poem. Um, I did a pilgrimage, an ancestral pilgrimage, to Finland a few years ago, and oops, and uh, went to all these different areas, mostly farmland, to see where my relatives had lived. And we made it to a farm, and there was a barn, and it had this writing on it. 
And I asked my cousin, I was in Finnish, I didn't know what it said, and she said, it said this. Landlady, <clears throat> Landlady Annika Matinturter, accused of bewitching, was sentenced by the church court in 1708 to sit for two Sundays in foot or ankle stocks. Ankle stocks were a punishment of shame in the church at that time, and if someone committed an act, you know, that was considered against the church morals, well, that person was locked up in Yalkapu, is what they were called, in front of the church. Every church had Yalkapu, and if the church thought someone was a witch, particularly a woman, sometimes the punishment commanded them to be burned alive. So this is a poem called A Generous Fever, um, Osterbothnia, Finland, 1708. See here on the side of this barn, that is my name, Anika. My family lived over there past the rye field, beside the endless pine, on the hill looking down in the, on the lake. There were many girls in the house, but I was the only one who dug up red worms with my crochet hook. The other girls kept quiet sewed their flaxen shirts, all got married, had fat pink babies. We never saw them again. I got married too. They made me almost pretty with star flowers in my hair. He went to school and then it started. They didn't like his new words in Greek. They had a trial, but he died of the fever. Another fever swept across the western hills Witches were in every pile of hay, every other church pew. One day they told me I was guilty. Old Lady Ina got a bellyache. She heard me singing on that same Sunday outside her window. I could tell them it was my mother's favorite song, but she would be a witch. I could say my father was walking with me. He would be a witch. I could say old Lady Ina always had a bellyache, ate too much fish fat, and pancakes. But they looked inside my pockets, dragonflies. I had found them down by the lake, but they said I had killed them. I had sung a spell. They put my ankles into the stocks on two different Sundays, one for each dead bug. After that, I took to my long walks far over hills, the lake, a tiny mica chip, the village, a distant piece of grit. And this is the way I learned to do it. Kicked baneberry and stitchwort. Kicked fireflies up the folds of my skirts. Emptied my pockets of dust and bee wings. Threw them on a chanting fire. And what never was attached itself, alive as any muse, any shrewd, dark animal breathing in the shadows. <clears throat> so I thought, this is the time of gardens. It's summer, gardens. We beg for that, we beg for feeding ourselves and enjoying anything that's growing. So this is a poem um, for this time of the gardens. It's called Hunger, but it kind of refers to many different kinds. Each time the hungry crows light on the freeway fence, I think of how we make a stab at feeding ourselves, how we reinvent our gardens when we can, lima beans and cantaloupe in R.L. Stevenson's Samoa, shallow running Japanese vegetables in Belgium, mung grown banana peppers and lemongrass in Minnesota. But it goes deeper than the gut, this hunger, this yearning and sorrow that balloons to fill all spaces, making us reel and wobble in the wake of its imbalance. It is why we flap our arms, if only in our dreams, to try, to fl try for flight, talk to God, voyage into wilderness. It is why the Russian guitar poets pass their songs through the factory underground. By Strauss, paralyzed with fear, still rode trains across America or why the migrate Aunt Cecilia pressed birth control into the hands of tired mothers and performed in Finnish plays for immigrants in 1920s iron ore mining towns. It is the drunken song of all of us 
longing beneath the stars. Shucking crayfish in Louisiana, digging sugar beets in North Dakota, starching uniforms for the hotel kitchen workers. Our days stream by a baptism of work. Mind numb, minds numb, bellies satiated, but still empty. At night, an incarnation of ritual sweeps across countertops, cooking fires, and oil-polished hardwood tables. Here we share, pray, and taste small bits of heaven. And we can take time and let it spill slowly from our fingers like so many peas into a wooden bowl. We find moonlight in the copper pot, snowdrops in the milk bottle. We find sadness and we find glory too. When we sit down and dine on hard bread and onions, rutabaga or blue corn cakes, we wrap up our stones of worry and set them out back by the stacks of old firewood. Each day, we are hungry, you and I. Tongues dry, lips white. We reach for each other and we taste it all, bitter and sweet. It floods our mouths. So I'd like to announce the next reader. I wouldn't be here as a part of the midstream reading series, um, which I also read many times in the other location, because another tradition of Dave Shove was to ask the writers, as Rosalie did, to um, suggest other poets or writers for the next session, or any session down the line. And this next reader, this next poet, gave my name. John Krumberger has published two full volumes of poetry, The Language of Rain and Wind by Backwaters Press, and Because Autumn, Main Street Rag Press, as well as a chapbook, which is in a jar somewhere through the Black Dirt Press. He is a PhD in psychology from the University of Minnesota and works as a psychologist in private practice in St. Paul, Minnesota. Please welcome John Krumberger. to go before Diane so I could introduce her, but she's very crafty that way. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read five or six poems, and mostly they're from a manuscript I'm sending out right now called When I Was a King, uh, written between 2015 and 2020. Two kind of surreal things happened in that time one Donald Trump was elected president and my wife died suddenly. So I'm not usually nervous when I read poetry, but I am tonight. Um, manuscript is called When I Was a King and the first, um, the first poem in the book is called When I Was a King. <clears throat> because I was a king, no moon could adjudicate me. I'd hide wherever I pleased, wild-eyed, ready to pounce, and they thrilled to it. Mother and daughter chirping with excitement as they rounded the curve, daughter calling, Papa, where are you? While I waited submerged in withered October leaves, having practiced my falling dead impersonation for just such a chance. The galaxy expanding as I held my breath, listening for footsteps back when the world loved us and we loved each other without fault. Um, in any collection of poems, I always have a, one or two poems about my work as a um, psychologist and psychotherapist. Um, some have uh, compared uh, therapy to alchemy, where you take the base metals and you pur purify and find the gold. Um, this poem for, it starts with a quote by Alice Miller, which I'll read here. 
is only after it's liberated in analysis that the self begins to be articulate. And the name of the poem is The Parlor. They come to this parlor of alchemy a little afraid of hope, yet they hope. Music flares from the bistro downstairs as if there was a soundtrack to the mystery of what we do here. And it's an honor, truly, to prospect beside them, finding the core, finding the gold, the stories dark, sometimes for months, with shards of memory much too heavy for anyone to bear alone. Each impurity unraveling, molecules breaking down, shame transformed to grief, then energy and soul, until one day as light streams through my east facing windows, I see we are all made of it and wonder who has shined for me the way I do for them. Um, this poem is uh, really about the um, the last moments of being with my wife as husband and wife, driving her to the hospital. It was still a week after that, but um, that was uh, the time in the hospital was something else. Um, so this is called "This Is It." You bring the New York Times with you which you won't get to read. We careen down the Franklin Hill to cross the Mississippi, joined by my 22-year-old self, who has traversed a different bridge to a new life, a new state, exclaiming, this is it. We welcome him, welcome the musicians he lived with that autumn, they who jammed all night and slept all day while he bicycled to the university. Our latitude is 44.973 north, longitude 93.258 west, zip code 55414. The leaves along shore luxuriate in the August light, the same leaves that were not leaves easily on your birthday in the spring, but pushing, fighting to exist as you coughed with what we thought was asthma. There's room enough for your roses and the cardinal pear who nested in our garden. Room for your garden, for your paintings, for the rabbits, sweet pea, and lulu. Room for Sherlock Holmes and Dalton Abbey all crammed into my Honda Civic. Your younger self is here, smiling as she answers the door on the Tuesday of our first date, sizing me up and having the advantage because she is so pretty. And your bearing down birthing self calling my name, though our noses touch, and your silly nun costume Halloween self flirting with my vampire self. Your sister tells me how to drive. Don't go too fast. Watch out for kids as she hurdles past towards her shards of glass and Appalachian dirt and grit, forever freeze-framed in that flight, Jeep and midair, about to crash, your bereft teenage self begging her not to leave. Now, we're past the bridge and melons from the sewer co-op are rolling on the floor. The dudes from the Las Campionas gym, each having bench pressed a single rhinoceros, flex while sitting in chairs outside watching the, set, the Saturday walkers. We're counting on your fabled luck even as it begins to drizzle. Every green light blesses our momentum. Breakfast from Maria's Cafe, soothing us with aromas. 
the way we need to be soothed. Just you and me now, trying to stay calm, driving to emergency, a slow car dawdling in front of us, a shortcut that's not a shortcut. Windshield wipers and pedestrians jangling our nerves, neither of us talking, both lost in the tunnels of our thoughts. Finally, an entrance in the rain where ambulances slumber. Breathing as best you can, your stone weight presses down on me as the doors open wide, last moment in the world before the hospital machinery catches you in its gears. So, um, I am, haven't been able to really fathom my life the last two or three years. Um, not only losing my wife, but meeting a wonderful woman that I'm in love with. And this poem is for her. It's called 18 Wadham Gardens for Elizabeth. As if 30 years hadn't passed, everything in its place. A row of prim Edwardians, hedges neatly trimmed. Your host the second from the last, next door to the Tory MP who once made a pass at you. The spacious front room with its sea of glass, your roses changing color and hue with each angle of light, and the long hallway, its vestibule and estuary, flowing to a harbor of kitchen smells and scenes of family life, a young American mother and wife in love with the vista stretched before you when things made sense, even the English weather there it is, you point, trying to pull me into that dream. Now it is, it's raining, or almost raining, or about to clear into sun. We walk the blocks to Trim, Primrose Hill, you turning back only once. Sweetie, I know there's no logic to it. How it is, we've been allowed a second life. Um, this poem has the distinction of having the longest title of maybe any poem I've ever read or written. Um, and it's inspired by the book, uh, Denison, Iowa, Searching for the Soul of America Through the Secrets of a Small Town. Uh, Denison, Iowa is a meatpacking town in the uh, middle of Iowa and has been changed dramatically by immigration. So um, the title of the poem is Why We Still Write Poems As the Country Succumbs to Meanness. When I tire of a language of artifice, empty as a clapper without a bell, I return to the flat speech of the Midwest, to Georgia Hulrest's simple kindness, teaching English three nights a week at Christ Lutheran, Denison, Iowa, each of her students with a story worthy of a novel, crossing rivers and borders to arrive at the idea of America, which starts here where men with knuckles swollen from shifts spent slashing out the guts of hogs and women whose eyes point down in shyness or shame struggle to wring some beauty from strange guttural sounds, more like the thunk of rain falling on cracked earth than the vowels of their native Spanish. The tenderness of September leaves outside and the immense sky above the plains holds them here in their adopted home while words won through faith and hard work are passed on and on some more. The way poetry begins with generosity. Okay, one last poem. Um, 
this poem is called What to Do in New York City. <laughs> so if anyone's going to go to New York City, uh, p pay special attention here. Walk. Walk along the flow of beans to a confluence of other beans. Walk the broad avenues whose monolithic towers scaffold skyward like stacked money ascending to God. Notice faces along the sidewalks pressed against the warmth of buildings laying or sitting, their possessions carried in a bag. Walk past the leash poodles, doodles, and kidney-shaped chihuahuas. Walk without a plan on side streets, dark but vibrant. Squeeze between the jostling crowds. Watch for traffic. Consult your maps. Smell odors unapologetically human. Descend subterranean subway caves or climb up to the high line, walking, walking. It's true. You've lived many lives. Live this one now, walking at past windows, opening to other lives. Imagine them, but desire only this. Stop for a beer. Observe the river, yawning and stretching. Listen to the languages around you. Now, resume walking. Don't ask where you're going. Let darkness fall around you as rain disperses equally on the, on the self-possessed and the dispossessed. For the time being, it is summer. For the time being, you are no one. Only the breeze, the rain, and the weeds sprouting between cracks of asphalt. Don't ask how much time is left. Just walk. Thank you. Thank you, John Kronberger. I'd like to also add that he is my daughter's godfather, so it was wonderful to hear you read again. <clears throat> Our next reader is Leah Rivamonte. She received grants from the Minnesota State Arts Board, MRAC's Next Step Fund, and a residency at Wellspring House, among others. Her poetry chapbook, Tell Me When You Get There, was published in 2019 by Finishing Line Press. She is currently, and possibly forever, working on a novel along with a few travel essays from a trip to the Philippines she made a few years back. She has an MFA in painting from the U of M and lives in St. Paul's Little Bohemia neighborhood. Please welcome Leah Rivamonte. Thanks, Diane. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, okay, so Marinduki is an island that my grandfather was born on, and it's part of the archipelago of the Philippines. Many of you know there are many, many, many islands in that archipelago. This one is off of Luzon, and it's the only uh, island province. This is called In Marinduque. This, by the way, is um, a portion of a travel piece I'm working on. I'm perched on Darling's narrow balcony overlooking the main plaza. Darling is my father's cousin Miguel's son. We may have been introduced when I visited here with my parents 30 years ago, but then it was a chaotic blur with Miguel's family of 10, a number of aunties and cousins, and we were a contingent of eight adults and children, including my father, Carlos, and his brother, Marcelo, who, it turned out, were local celebrities regarded as heroes for their actions during the Japanese occupation. The whole community came out to welcome them with a coronation, speeches by town dignitaries, and a disco-style dance number performed by school kids. My dad and uncle looked on from their thrones, dad beaming, my shy, introverted uncle stricken with embarrassment. Today, however, there are no children, no manos or manongs, no elders, except, of course, us, no aunties to make a fuss. Of his immediate family, only Darling's sister has remained in the area, 
and this lifelong bachelor, newly retired, has nothing to prove to this strange woman who has come to visit without warning or invitation. He is gracious, despite my intrusion, appropriately inquisitive and kind. He tells me that up to last July, he worked as an official in the agricultural department. He was vague, but more than likely his limited English vocabulary and my non-existent Tagalog were too much of a barrier to describe the work accurately. In any case, it didn't seem to be the work he was passionate about, and now that he has retired, he has let it go without much regret. On this typically warm November afternoon, his gently lined, jowly face is untroubled, but there is an air of melancholy about him. His shoulders slope, and though he is not fat, his belly hangs an inch or two over his belt line. I have a feeling he doesn't get much exercise. The main form of exercise for adult males here is basketball, the national obsession. I don't think I saw a single runner on the island. Even if I had been tempted to jog in this heat, such a display would have made me look even more out of place than I already did, not to mention an annoying obstacle on much trafficked roads. Darling is wearing a white t-shirt, Bermuda shorts, and flip-flops. This, I'm guessing, is his daily uniform. There's never a need for anything more here on this island as far as weather goes, possibly less in fact. I'm guessing, too, that this perennial bachelor is gay. There is a certain delicacy in the way he moves, and later when I'm walking behind him on the beach, his loose-hipped sway is very apparent. Much later when I broach the subject with Honest, his 30-year-old nephew, a doctor, he supposes so too, but he tells me no one in the family has ever discussed it. On the surface, at least, Darling seems to have shared the seems to have sh to, on the surface, at least, Darling seems to share the Bahala Na attitude that undergirds much of life here. Even the dogs are complicit in the sort of passive acceptance of the world as it is. Though their ribs are sharply outlined beneath their dull fur, they lie on the ground and never beg, but wait patiently for scraps. They know that where there are people, there is food. Maybe they are saving their energy for more important things like chewing and swallowing. As for people, this let it go, go with the flow way of being may be changing. The ambition I glimpsed in the shiny faces of the youth and many of the young adults I have spoken with and observed in my little time in the Philippines, especially in Manila, but here in the provinces as well, is palpable. Possibility is served up daily in the media. The young intelligentsia has already made their mark on digital media and tech startups. Surely it is inevitable that those omniscient screens displaying the insistent message that continuous activity, no matter how meaningless, coupled with the need for abundance in all things, it w is what constitutes the life worth living, no matter what the parish priest says. Agri Eliza, Darling's niece, is home on break from law school. She and her mother, Lovely, have appeared with a tray of bottled soft drinks. Although my visit was a complete surprise and darling as a single man might not make a fuss, the two women never skipped a beat. They are quite willing to drop everything and hang out with me, even though they only know I am Miguel, AKA Mike's cousin, Carlos's daughter, traveling alone without her family. Why didn't you call us, they ask. We would have picked you up, they exclaim. Why don't you stay here, come. Let's go get your suitcase. We have room. They are mortified to have a relative staying somewhere other than their home. I'm very sorry that I didn't let you know I was coming, I say. I didn't know how to contact you. Please, don't worry, I'm fine at the hostel and have paid for the week. Where is your husband, your children? Surely I can't have left them behind. But that's exactly what I did do. And now it's my turn to be ashamed. I say that I'm here to see what it's like, if it has changed, how much it has changed, how it has changed. Actually, I'm here to visit this place and become acquainted with a family that I had imagined the main character of my novel might have come from, to see where she was raised, to answer for myself why she would have left. I share none of this. I tell them instead, I wanted to see if it was still as beautiful as it was when I last visited, and it is. Next time, I will bring my family. They smile eager to know just when that will be. They are not convinced. I am an older woman traveling on her own to a place very distant from the comforts of home, and worse still, I didn't even let them know I was coming. 
I am their responsibility. Someone has to be responsible for me. Traveling at my age without a husband is not only unusual, but also a little ominous. Suddenly, even I am beginning to question my own intentions. Also, at this moment, I am having a hard time understanding exactly why my main character would have left this paradise. The family is so loving, and the town so full of life. The weather is temperate if humid. There are fine sandy beaches, transparent blue-green water, a scuba dive's fantasy. This island life is what most of us dream of. So their house, um, uh, right across from the main plaza, is also adjacent to the church, um, which exists in a churchyard. And this poem I wrote after observing a morning in that churchyard. It's called Churchyard on a Saturday Late Morning, Santa Cruz, Marinduque. One, schoolgirls in threes and fours, voices pitched high, clutch their mobiles tight, white blouses trim as sails, maroon skirts swaying, book bags thump against sharp-boned hips while the boys sit curbside, mouths full of chips, shoulders slumping as the girls breeze past. Two, under the cool spread of an acacia tree, vendors sell ices, snacks, and saints to workmen on break. Along the rectory wall, deep curved niches house larger versions of those same saints, their plaster chipped and peeling. The devoted kneel before them, rise to light candles and iron stands, wicks sputter in the damp, heavy air, their eternal flames quickly doused. Three. At the entrance to the church, a wooden funeral coach hitched to a black SUV is overlaid with tin embossed with fleur-de-lis. The silvery metal glimmers under the harsh noon sun. Plastic purple tulips are strewn atop its roof, the name Danny handwritten across the curtained window. Four. Sounds from the sanctuary waft into the yard. The priests wrote prayers and mourners sing song harmonies, soothing even to the godless. Suddenly, the church doors fling wide. Pallbearers blow through, shouldering the box with Danny's remains, slide it with ease into the back of the coach. Danny is light in bone and flesh. Five. The mourners follow sweep past the coffin, hushed as they gather at the gate that opens onto the street. The hard-surfaced car, pulling the fanciful coach, leads the procession of mourners on foot, who pop umbrellas open against the unrelenting sun. Women and girls link arms. Onlookers give way as the solemn parade moves through the plaza with basketball court and city hall, past the Sari Sari store and the uniformed guard posted at Mercury Drugs. Six. After crossing the river at the edge of town, the parade halts before another gate, an odd metropolis, overbuilt, stacked high with dead. The mourners fan out, parched from the heat, dreaming of cool, of wet, and finding no relief, they plunk down on the whitewashed concrete to pray and whisper goodbye. Seven. Sun bleaches and time withers our own grief. And though we do not forget them, we no longer know where to look for our dead. Like the candles whose flames are extinguished too soon, our promise melts over time, hardening into something we no longer recognize. Those beloved faces, our yearning, how bright they once were, how cool to touch. Thank you. Thank you, Leah Villamonte. So um, before we have our last reader, uh, and I did remember you again, <laughs> I'm going to pass the hat around because uh, Unity Unitarian has, Church has been so um, generous to let us use this beautiful room, but um, for us for free, but it costs them, of course, to have this going. So I'm just going to pass in case anybody wants to 
to uh, put a little offering in for the church. Looks yeah. done. Ty Bo Ewell is a Gen X Minneapolis based trans masculine queer author and writer who mostly bartends and serves to make a living. He was enlightened by the activism and hedonism of the 90s in San Francisco. He tried to change the course of queer history by opening the last Dyke Bar in Minneapolis in 2007. His lifelong academic pursuit was to argue intelligently with conservative Christians, which eventually led to a master's degree from Harvard Divinity School. But no prospects for fruitful conversations nor any professional direction. He uses humor and introspection to create whimsical, insightful prose for artisanal audiences. And he is also the author of Chemically Enhanced Butch, a memoir by Tai Bo Yul. And just a little, uh, we have books available here, so please um, uh, add them to your library because um, we write them for a reason, and particularly, I, I wasn't supposed to even read tonight, so June Blumenson and Haley Crickwood were supposed to be here tonight, um, but there was COVID involved and family emergencies. Hopefully they will come another time. But these writers are here tonight, and they would like to share their work. So let's welcome Ty Bo Yule. and then I'm just going to read a couple passages from the book. Um, as you said, I'm Ty. I'm 52, and I'm a server and a bartender. I've largely given up on making more of myself. I'm happy with the life I've cultivated. I've done some cool things in my life. I wrote a book about them. That was also a cool thing that I did. I still write things when I feel I have something to say. I'm also trans. I started off life as um, Tara. This is an important fact only because many of my punchlines wouldn't land if you didn't know that. I didn't start transitioning until I was 41. Before that, for most of my life, I was an easily identifiable butch dyke. There was rarely a need for me to come out to anyone. Other queers knew instantly I was their potential ally or that I might be available for dates. For everyone else, I was a manifest opportunity to work out their own obscure feelings about non-normative gender expression. And everyone has feelings about that. Gender is foundational to how we feel about ourselves and how we interact with the world. So when someone does it differently, it loosens the screws momentarily on our most unexamined assumptions. When people met me as a butch, they have felt curious, confusion, aggression. They might be caught off guard by some latent fetish they hadn't anticipated. Most people felt comfortably entitled to center their feelings about how I looked to them and share them with me. <clears throat> I don't bring this up to elicit sympathy. I find gender and the querying of gender and people's primal attachments to their presumptions about gender deeply fascinating. It can also be tedious and frustrating. When I finally made the decision to transition, it was simply because I was tired. Now being read as a straight, cisgendered white man is the least exhausting experience I could have ever imagined. <laughs> people go out of their way to help me be mediocre. <laughs> I can go to whatever rural red state gas station I want and use a public toilet whenever I want. I choose when I come out to people, and that is a privilege and a responsibility. 
queers and especially trans people are in the crosshairs of an emboldened and strengthen, strengthening national movement to strip away our humanity. Right. An increasingly vocal anti-democratic political force is using our most vulnerable queer youth to further their nationalistic vision of restrict, restricted norms. I wrote this book with the privilege of my age and relative stability. I use humor to disarm the relentless historical ignorance and fear I continue to encounter on behalf of those in my community who haven't had enough time to grow their, to grow into their armor. It is my responsibility to come out whenever I can and reattach humanity to queers through storytelling. My personal comfort is rarely interrupted by conflict or hostility. <coughs> it's also a little less fabulous. I'm not as charming as I used to be. I don't have ready access to my magic anymore. Without daily adversity, I've lost the eye of the tiger. Every awesome thing I ever did should be imagined as a training montage from a Rocky movie. <laughs> it was my theology for most of my life. I used to think I could beat the odds, be that one in a million, and change the world. I used to think that I could prove my mother wrong. <laughs> the book I wrote is a chronicle of my struggles, adventures, and accomplishments, but it's also a love letter to my mother. I know that she's right. Everyone judges you by your appearance, and that fact has been confirmed repeatedly by every interaction I have ever had. However, my enduring resistance to dockers and golf shirts is probably the largest contributing factor to my enchanted journey. <laughs> and like most Gen X queers, I've been in a fight with the mainstream all along. So I'd just like to read a couple, if I still have time, um, passages from the book. This is actually how the book begins, and it's me and my mother fighting, because that's what we do. Um, are you going to stop dressing like a gas station attendant now? <laughs> this wasn't the first time my mother had asked me that. We've been fighting about my appearance since the 70s, a decade that still employed gas station attendants. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the point of this was for you to blend in now, she said. What do you think I'm going to wear now? Did you think I would start dressing like Dad? Do you see any dockers and golf shirts around you, I asked. You don't have to wear golf shirts, but you could you could look normal. I thought you could look clean now that you're going to Harvard, you know, just blend in a little. Where do you blend, Ma? Out to lunch in Palm Springs? Seriously, where do you and Dad blend? We were getting louder. People at the Mexican Fusion restaurant were staring. We paid our bill and spilled out onto Mass Ave. We were yelling now. My mother was hurling the word blend at me like it was a spell and she was a well-dressed Disney villainess conjuring the dark magic of suburbs everywhere to permanently fuse a light blue Oxford button-up to my skin. <laughs> she was so mad she didn't even care that the muggles in Cambridge could see the laser beams shooting out from her eyes. <laughs> at 41, I could still do nothing to stem the shame of knowing that I was a cliché. An overprivileged, underachieving, urban queer with all of the fashion that implies. But I'd gotten into Harvard, which I did solely to impress my parents and avoid this ongoing conflict. My best defense in the moment was, they let me in because I'm weird, Ma. People think I'm cool. <laughs> what people? She asked. She did have a point. <laughs> Earlier that day, my mother and I were sitting in my small room in Brookline. She was visiting during my second semester at Harvard Divinity School. Part of her still didn't believe I'd gotten in, so she seemed relieved that the people of the school recognized me. <laughs> there was an atmosphere of giddiness and trepidation around us, as if Harvard might call any second to tell us they'd discovered their error and would appreciate it if we left quietly. <laughs> I'd warned my mother over the phone that I had something to tell her. We'd gone to breakfast at the Busy Bee Cafe across the street, where the waitresses were all over 50, had real Boston accents, and wore brightly colored running shoes. Our waitress was just telling Mom what a nice boy I was when I started to fall apart over my eggs, so we went back to my room. You know I've always, you know I've always been sort of masculine. 
pretty awkward as a girl. I was sitting by the window, staring at my hands, starting to tear up. Yes, her voice firm, letting me know she was ready. I'd been having this conversation with my mother in my head for weeks, not caring that passing strangers could see my lips moving, that the well-crafted, assertive essay that I'd perfected during this exercise fell out of my mouth as a stuttering monologue about her long history of fighting about my clothes. Remember when we had to go shopping for a prom dress for me and even you thought I looked ridiculous? <laughs> Remember how attached I was to that army fatigue jacket in junior high? I don't know where this was, I, where I was going with this preface, but my mom figured it out. I was about to remind her she'd always suggested a tunic as a unisex option for formal wear, but I thought I looked terrible in tunics when she stopped me. <coughs> you want to do what Benny did? Benny, my best friend back in Minneapolis, had started taking testosterone to become a man a couple years before this. Yes, was all I could get out. I couldn't look at her. She sighed. Oh, thank God. I thought you were going to tell me something important. <laughs> I stopped crying and stared at her. In the silence that followed, my eyebrows affected befuddlement, then anger, and then I started laughing. And so did my mom. We both laughed, that laugh of venting lifelong mutual anxiety that only the two of us share. It went on for quite some time. Well, you always did suck at being a girl, she offered in lieu of some time-consuming, <laughs> gratuitous gesture of sentimentality. Should we go do your laundry now? <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, thanks. Um, I don't know. I can stop there. I have one more? Okay. Um, so, this is, it, this is from high school. Um, I'm, uh, uh, so... The 80s and um, I had just been outed in high school but I had also learned about gay bars which I started going to with a fake ID as a teenager <clears throat> another unfortunate thing that happened in this tiny span of time I was hanging out at Robbie's that's a dyke bar in Los Angeles Pomona California at the time when the varsity softball coach from my high school walked in I was hoping to play varsity that year, so I knew it was a bad idea to let her see me. I tried to duck out. She saw me. Shit. I didn't know how to play it, so I pretended like she didn't see me. I didn't talk to her, and then three days later, I was called in the vice principal's office and told that numerous mothers had called to school, expressing concern that I might be sharing a locker room with their daughters. This might sound familiar now with the, what's going on. The school would appreciate it if I didn't play sports anymore. I was kicked out of high school sports for being a lesbian. 30 years later, the irony of that punchline makes the story a hit at parties. Um, in 1987, though, I was just pissed. That bitch. That spineless bitch. Nobody's fucking mother called the school. This is the way you save your own ass by throwing me under the bus. The thing about 1987, though, is that it was still in the, in the 80s. I lived in a small conservative town in Southern California, and Reagan was president. This was the height of the golden age for televangelists. AIDS was still rel relatively new and scandalous and made all gay people a public health hazard. Teachers were losing their jobs just for being gay. As excited as I was about my new identity, I also knew it meant there was something wrong with me that I should hide. That coach was hiding too. We never talked about it. I never put up a fight. I stormed home and announced to my parents that I didn't want to play sports anymore. <coughs> That's fine, you can get another job, they said. I didn't tell them. I had already put them through too much. I came out to my mother during one of our frequent conflicts over just what the hell was wrong with me. I'm gay, I shouted. I hadn't been expecting to tell her. It actually calmed her. Mom's a problem solver. Confronted with an actual problem, she springs into action. Chastity Bono had just come out to share and the world, and the world, and also had a mullet. 
So mom had a cultural reference <laughs> that drew aspirational parallels between her life and Cher's. <laughs> she called Barb, the lesbian she knew from the 70s, so I had someone to talk to. She bought me a copy of Ruby Fruit Jungle. She was grateful that I had an identifiable disadvantage. Something was wrong with me. I was grateful for this as, as well. Now we both had something else to blame instead of each other or ourselves. My mother has hated most of the lifestyle and wardrobe choices in my life, but she has always been supportive in her own solution-oriented way. This wasn't going to hold me back. When she told my father, they both admitted they had individually suspected this since I was eight. Might have been nice to have a family meeting. Since neither had a moral conflict concerning the revelation, they both set about imagining how a successful lesbian might look. They got me golf lessons at their country club. Even then I wouldn't wear golf shirts and I might have scared the club pro a little. But it was a good way for all of us to negotiate our new circumstances. When I brought home my new girlfriend, Tiffany, they were unimpressed. It's one thing to be gay, but don't be gay with her. <laughs> but because of all the recent drama, they tried to be supportive of this new direction, even though she was an adult and I'd met her at a bar and I was still 17. The relationship was just boring enough to be a welcome departure from everything else that had occurred. They were willing to bargain for boring. Just get through school, don't get weird. They had also lowered their expectations. It was a fragile yet workable ceasefire when I came home and told my mom that a boy in my math class had asked me to the senior prom. She simply set aside her exhausted confusion and let herself get a little excited about getting me a dress. Barth Monk was in my calculus class. If ever there was a platonic form of nerd, someone would make a glorious statue of Barth. He had the extra thick glasses that made his eyes look bigger and thick wavy hair he parted on the side. He had acne under his movie theater manager mustache. He wore Izod shirts tucked to in his pleated dockers and penny loafers with real pennies in them. <laughs> he was the only person at school unaware of my reputation because nobody talked to him. So he was nice to me. Of course I agreed to go to the prom with Barth. <coughs> Mom and I we're going dress shopping. Mom and I started off at one of those stores in small towns that specialize in prom dresses and evening wear for Rotary Club soirees. <laughs> 1987 was the year everybody went around looking ready for their glamour shot at the mall. It was an epic year for colors of taffeta and poofy sleeves. I refused to even try them on, but after some lengthy and contentious debates with my mother in front of the clerks centered on what everyone else would be wearing to prom, I said, fine, you asked for it. <clears throat> Sorry. When I emerged from the dressing room looking like a homemade tissue box cozy, even, <laughs> even my mother couldn't contain her laughter. <laughs> you like it, I said. How about in coral? Perhaps the sleeves could be a little bigger. She relented and said, okay, let's go to Nordstrom's. We drove to an actual department store. They had prom dresses too, but we now both understood that I could not wear what the other girls would be wearing. Neither of us knew why, but we agreed I could not pull it off. We found what we were looking for on the sales rack in the cocktail dresses section. The dress was back, black and backless, with long sleeved and a collared neck. It had a large sequin sash in front and was slit up the back of the skirt. It accentuated and flattered, <clears throat> and flattered my adult curves. It was Alexis Carrington from Dynasty rather than Mallory from Family Ties. <laughs> In retrospect, I was wearing drag. It's the only way I could pull off female. And the only drag that suited me was slutty bitch. It was the perfect dress for that. My mother was thrilled and thought I looked classy. <laughs> Thank you, Time Will Yule. 
Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm going to pass this. Uh, those of you who might want to be on the, the mid, I can't talk, midstream reading series that aren't signed up to get the mailings, you can sign up here or you can go to uh, the website midstream reading series.wordpress.com and you can sign up there as well. Uh, there are books available. Please forget, don't forget to check those out. And um, everybody will be, if people want to meet at Sweeney's afterwards, you're all welcome to raise a glass to France and democracy. <laughs> um, next, uh, uh, the next midstream reading is August 11th, and it will be Chelsea Desotel. Is that how you pronounce her name? Okay. Roy White, Tim Nolan, and Althina Kildegard. So come back for that. These are wonderful writers. Um, I'm honored to be a part of this, hosting this, and I'm so amazed that everybody showed up on a beautiful summer night. So thank you all for coming, and see you again on another evening here in a very different kind of setting <laughs> than we're used to for midstream. But we love it. It's very beautiful. Thanks so much.